Hey, there we go. Uh, hey, everyone. Sorry, I had to change my camera, unfortunately. So, any which way, thanks, thanks a lot for inviting me and Sai, and I think we we are glad to be a part of this meetup, and and we'll be glad to talk about chaos engineering. I I see a lot of SREs who have joined in, so so it'll be fun to talk about chaos. So so let me just uh, share my screen. Give me a second. Is my screen visible to everyone? It is. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. So as you can see, Litmus Chaos 2.0, I mean, uh, Litmus Chaos, we'll, we'll talk about the project later on. I think, uh, I mean, a lot of folks might be new to chaos engineering or or might have already had an idea about what chaos engineering is. So we'll we'll be talking about chaos engineering first, and then we'll we'll be introducing Litmus Chaos to you folks. So so it's, it's going to be a journey for everyone. But before that, uh, let me just introduce myself and and then we we can get started so a little bit about myself i mean my name is prithvi raj and i work as a community manager for the Litmus chaos project at chaos native what chaos native is chaos native is a company which helps provide support for chaos engineering or in case you are looking for enterprise support or help on getting started with chaos then chaos native comes into play and i all of this started at Maya Data. Maya Data is a company which was initially sponsoring Litmus Chaos, but as of now, it, it Litmus Chaos grew in such a way as a project that eventually it it turned out to become a company altogether. That now now the team is working on contributing to Litmus as as well as uh, providing enterprise support. Other than that, I help uh, co-organize uh, Chaos Carnival. That's a global conference which happens uh, every year for Chaos Engineering, specifically Kubernetes Community Days. Bangalore, I mean, Kubernetes Community Days is happening around the world, thanks to CNCF for helping sponsor it. And that's, that's an amazing space to get started with Kubernetes or Kubernetes-related technologies. And alongside that, obviously, I, I organize uh, chaos engineering meetups every last Saturdays of the month. So if in the CNCF ecosystem, so if if you want to join in, then feel free to. You can we can find the CNCF chaos engineering meetup group on the community channel and feel feel free to join in to learn more about chaos. And uh, these are my socials. And I think uh, Tyen perhaps uh, could have introduced himself, but I think I'll have to pass on the control to him. So. Sian works alongside me as, as a software engineer at Chaos Native. He's been one of the core contributors to Litmus, and I allow him to introduce more once he, he gets started. So moving on, the agenda for today, we'll be talking about Chaos Engineering, what, what Chaos Engineering is, how, how it started, what, what, is the, what are basically the requirements, and why is it necessary, and then we'll slowly introduce Litmus to you, the journey of, of the project, and why it's been advantageous to use litmus for your chaos engineering needs and then we'll we'll have a demo as well so so keep your seat belts tight and let's let's get started so uh, i mean before before we start off before we start with anything let's let's just discuss what resilience is or how resilience has been uh, vital or helpful in you know bringing the the term called chaos engineering into fray or what exactly has been a resilience in the Kubernetes ecosystem and how how it it's being seen? I mean, we we see as resi I mean, we define resilience as nothing but the ability of your system to stand still or stay strong in spite of a vulnerability that you know comes up or attacks the system or stay afloat when a fault happens. And and that is what gave rise to the idea of a system where uh, idea of chaos engineering where a system had to be resilient in spite of a fault happening or in spite of a chaotic situation occurring. So in, in the Kubernetes ecosystem, I mean, Kubernetes is growing like anything. It's already reached major adoption and all monolithic systems are, are shifting to Kubernetes or even from VMs, people are trying to bring in Kubernetes in their infrastructure and architecture. So these are some examples that we took before uh, defining chaos engineering that what exactly can happen or possibly happen in a Kubernetes infrastructure. So I mean, the first example, obviously, a pod is evicted from a node. 
I mean, that's that's the example of some sort of a situation, a chaotic situation that can happen. And let's say if if the pod is rescheduled or the dependent service is healthy, then the dependent uh, then obviously it's an example of a resilient infrastructure or resilience is maintained. But let's say, I mean, if if the dependent service slows down or turns out to be unhealthy, that's the example of a weakness. One of the examples of, you know, your system being weak. And similarly, these are a couple of more examples that we took that a node goes to a not ready state and a memory leak in, in you know, a disk or a CPU. And that is where if the, the dependent service turns out to be healthy, then of course it's, you know your systems are still resilient but how do you figure that out beforehand itself by by repeatedly testing right so so that is what somehow brought such a situation where cloud native chaos engineering or chaos uh, engineering in the kubernetes paradigm came out to be important and if the dependent services turn out to be unhealthy then obviously you identify the weakness you fix it and then you continue to test so before we introduce chaos let's just understand what brought in the need for it i mean these are some examples of, of down, down times that have affected enterprises and companies worth millions i mean you can see apple uh, delta airlines the airline sector is focusing on chaos engineering today i mean you will be shocked to hear that but these outages have have cost a loss loss of billions and similarly netflix back when netflix uh you know, discovered or invented chaos engineering they they believe that you know they, there is some sort of a repeatedly testing paradigm that was uh, required to test or inject faults into their system and identify the possible outages that can happen in the future and basically prevent these downtimes because they, they turn out to be expensive. I mean, just taking an example from India itself, in India, Amazon usually has its uh, Great Indian Festivals or, you know, Flip, there's a company called Flipkart, which is majorly owned by Walmart. They have uh, their big billion day sales. And during that sort of a time, there's a, there's a spike in the number of users or there, there are so many users are wanting to purchase, uh, curate so many transactions at a particular point of time. And that is where there's a possibility of an outage. There's a possibility that the, the system might go down. And that is why it, it basically requires to test the system in production of such sort of scenarios. And that is what brought in the term chaos engineering into fray. So chaos engineering is nothing but testing the system in production repeatedly by inducing a fault deliberately or injecting a fault deliberately into a system. Let's say, for example, in the Kubernetes space, a pod delete or or a pod CPU hog or something of that sort to identify the weaknesses that your system might have. And you do it in a controlled way so that obviously your system doesn't go down uh, uh, completely due to an unpredictable behavior but this is only to find out what sort of real world scenarios uh, can basically happen on an unpredictable scenario that might take your system down so to identify these weaknesses you break things on purpose obviously a lot of you might have heard that chaos engineering is breaking things on purpose but i believe or basically the community litmus chaos community believes that it's breaking things on purpose to make your systems resilient that is what the definition of chaos engineering is so moving on i mean why chaos engineering people people might believe that why is this sort of a technology important or why is chaos engineering vital in in your systems i mean this this is an example of a kubernetes application in form of a pyramid and and you can see that you know the application is not just your application but there are so many other layers to it where you, there is your application and then there are other services mongodb kafka and other cncf projects and then you, there are cloud native services i mean as as anthony mentioned i mean prometheus there are your metrics and your database through open ebs and then your kubernetes services are there which which are working uh, i mean fine until they are supposed to and you, you know an outage is just a call away and a possibility of an outage is always lying there there always exists a possibility it's just about the time when it happens and it's just about you being prepared for it and lastly obviously there are platform services uh, the infrastructure layer basically so there are various layers to your application and each layer has a possibility of a vulnerability or a possibility of your system going down and that is where chaos 
I mean, it just depends on all these components and that is where chaos engineering comes into play where you test each and every layer, you test each and every uh, component or basically a service that is running with chaos experiments and these experiments help you identify the weaknesses in your system so so you can see too many applications i mean this is a, a dynamic world uh, the the world is shifting to modern and dynamic infrastructures and and with too many applications it can obviously affect the resilience of your service so you need to obviously constantly test you need to constantly curate real world scenarios to validate the resiliency of your system this is how basically that that is what laid the foundation of project litmus or basically bringing in chaos engineering to the kubernetes paradigm so i mean in the devops loop obviously on the dev side of things there yeah, are so many tests that already is being done i mean e2e test penetration testing qa validation and there are so many testing but i mean adrian cockcroft and there are so many people uh, who who brought in chaos monkey and started off this practice of chaos engineering to basically bring in the principle of the chaos first that is why to wait for your systems to go down test from the beginning test initially to basically find out the vulnerabilities and chaos engineering is focused more on the op side of things or, or, or the operation side of things where sres and usually it, it 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 was initially practiced by mostly sres or security testers where where they they focused on reliability and brought in chaos engineering as a practice to validate their slas and slos and slis and then obviously slowly slowly the the paradigm is shifting towards the developer persona as well uh, as being a part of the community since the past one year it's it's been it's been great to see that uh, even the dev persona has been focusing on using chaos engineering and test don't wait i mean vulnerability can happen anytime so it's it's better you test your systems initially so this is how uh, chaos engineering is practiced in four uh, simple steps i mean before i move to this i'll i'll just take you through a link which talks about the principles of chaos engineering so as you can see this was a document formulated back in 2019 by and it's an open source document so you you can see it defines chaos engineering obviously as we did and how is chaos engineering practiced so they, it is practiced in four simple steps uh, or i mean there are advanced principles but if the four simple steps that we define is initially you start by defining the steady state of your system what is the steady state how is your system behave when it's functioning normally and how is your system behaving in, in its normal state and then you hypothesize around the steady state and you think about the real world scenarios i mean you build a hypothesis around the steady state what is the output of the system when it's showing a steady state behavior and then you think about the real world scenarios that can happen i mean your servers can die there can be software failures hardware failures malfunctions or even non failure events like i i mentioned initially a spike in in user traffic there is i mean take an example of netflix uh, a popular series comes out and there's a spike in traffic and that is a real world scenario where they need to scale they need to understand how to make the system scalable in spite of a sp spike in traffic and then you run these experiments in production you run certain experiments chaos experiments in if you talk about aws then it can be an ec2 terminate or if you talk about vms then it can be a vm power off which can be a chaos experiment we'll move to the various uh, chaos experiments that are out there curated by litmus but uh, i mean systems behave according to you know the the dependencies that they have so obviously it's important to run them in production and continuously run them in a control fashion to basically understand the vulnerabilities and you have to make it automated so this is the fourth step where you have to run them continuously test your systems con continuously and obviously manually it becomes difficult so automation is the key to to run chaos engineering and eventually you minimize the blast radius because obviously your systems can go down anytime and softwares are designed according to a particular sort of impact that they can handle so that is why minimizing your blast radius is important because uh, it might cause unnecessary harm or pain to your systems so experimenting in production should be done with care 
So moving on again, as, as we go back to the four simple steps, that is what we do. You identify the steady state, hypothesize around it, you run your experiments, and then you adapt accordingly or see your systems adapt according to the chaos tests that are being run. And that is how your resiliency is built. So we'll go to a detailed workflow of how chaos engineering is practiced. You identify your steady state conditions. You introduce a fault. And then are the steady state conditions regained? If yes, of course, your systems are resilient. But are they resilient against the other attacks that are possible? Of course not. So you inject a new fault. You continuously test. And if there is a weakness that is found, you fix it, you introduce the fault again, and the workflow goes on. So this is the workflow that we have defined for running a chaos engineering experiment. And, and, and that is how basically you inject a fault into, into your system and curate chaos. So moving on, how is it typically done? I mean, there are so many folks who are already practicing chaos. But as of now, only SREs were practicing it and developers were not engaging into it. But since the past few months or since the last year, we, we have seen the developers and engaging into it. Companies or enterprises organize game days where they run specific chaos engineering uh, experiments according to their application. What kind of a chaos test will fit their application? How is the system behaving when it's run? So the game days are being run by enterprises to identify such experiments and to jot down, basically create a white paper around it and create an analogy based on the chaos experiments that are good for your system. I mean, people have rarely integrated it into the CI CD, but make no mistake, chaos engineering should be run on all stages. We'll move to that, but on your CI CD as well, chaos engineering has to be run. And observability, I mean, Anthony gave such an amazing presentation on observability and how Grafana is helping that. I mean, it's it's not a commodity. It's 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 required for each and every enterprise, each and every uh, persona to come in and observe what is exactly happening. And I think when we move to the demo, we'll be observing how chaos is happening in your systems and monitoring and obviously logging is pretty important to identify where the systems are going down for how long the systems are going down, when the chaos is scheduled and what is the normal behavior of the system and when is it coming back up so so this is how typically it's done and i think there's there's still a, a cultural uh, stigma which which doesn't allow people to adopt chaos engineering practices i mean people still fear or the the infrastructure is not in place or the the uh, there's i mean they they still uh, are not ready to allocate the money behind it the, they believe it's costly or something of that sort but but personally i believe that uh, chaos engineering is a must and it's already it's it was yet to cross the chasm i mean kubernetes native chaos engineering yes is yet to cross the adoption uh, chasm, but uh, I think chaos engineering is coming up into majority with, uh, into, I mean, companies like Amazon, Netflix, Apple, Google, all of them, Microsoft, stressing on chaos engineering practices. So, so it becomes pretty vital for each and every infrastructure to be running chaos engineering tests. So, introducing Litmus, I mean, Litmus, uh, it it started back in 2018. It started off as a project. I mean, uh, to test another tool set, we were looking to test uh, a database tool set called OpenEBS. It's for cloud native data management. And we, we were looking for the engineering tools that were out there and none satisfied the maintainers, the initial founders of the project. And today it's a CNCF project. It's a CNCF sandbox project, hoping to move into incubation very soon. And it, its initial mission was to obviously help Kubernetes native SREs and developers to find weaknesses. In, in in their platforms and induce chaos engineering tests in a controlled way but today with litmus developing in such a way it's 100 percent open source by the way so you can uh, contribute to it it, it inv invites contributions there are so many use cases that have come up from the fintech sector from the banking sector telco sector which which have helped develop this project into work uh, into working for various use cases that are out there are various functionalities it can provide but as a framework it it uh, i mean the the next steps or obviously the current scenario also states that it helps you induce chaos in non kubernetes scenarios as well so if you are running aws i mean anything vm vms bare metal azure gcp you can induce even for monoliths as well you you can 
induce chaos engineering tests with litmus so these are some project stats obviously it's it's grown into having 50 plus chaos experiments i mean that uh, it's almost reaching 500000 experiment runs and uh, 200 plus 200000 plus installations soon so it's a, it's it's i mean i'll be sharing uh, the links but the project has grown since the past 3 years and today i mean uh, there are so many people who have adopted from red hat to vmware to dell there there are so many folks that are running this project so where in uh, the devops uh, cycle you can use litmus i mean you can use in your dev ci pipelines you can run your tests in your staging pre production production in your developer clusters i mean you can run chaos everywhere and you know chaos engineering is something which people believed is a luxury but it's it's a necessity today so i mean i i would love to invite folks to to run chaos engineering tests with litmus anywhere and everywhere you want to basically make them resilient so this is the journey of litmus that i would like to talk about and perhaps then sayan can take over and give you a demo and perhaps we can answer some questions as well so initially we created a chaos hub so and, and made it open source of course so as you can see this is the chaos hub so i mean it, it's uh, it it started off for kubernetes and you know there are so many experiments that are out there generic kubernetes experiments kafka based experiments cassandra open ebs aws based experiments vmware core dns gcp azure and more to come i mean with with the project developing more there are more to come and it's open source so you can contribute your own experiments as well so as you can see these are a few experiments and it's basically a marketplace to uh pull in your chaos experiments no other project provides that so i mean that's that's obviously an amazing feature i hope you find it amazing too so you can see a few chaos experiments that are out there pod delete cpu hawk container kill pod network duplication node io stress core dns pod delete and there are so many more experiments we'll be sharing the links as as the talk goes on and that is what was created initially for users to pull in the chaos experiments easily and then obviously there were custom resources that were created operators to help you run your chaos schedulers to help you schedule your chaos when do you want your chaos to start when do you want your chaos to end and for how long it should function and then obviously individual experiments slowly were created but with 2.0 we wanted to create the uh, basically curate a better experience for for users i mean we wanted to bring in a ui for you to visualize running your chaos and basically it was also focusing on enterprises how teams are running chaos how multiple folks can run chaos scenarios focusing on monitoring and observability by integrating a dashboard and introducing a chaos center to manage all your all your chaos experiments from one particular point i think we all go to that when we start with the demo but calculating your resilience score managing your workflows using gitops and scaling them so all these things plus creating a workflow a workflow is nothing but automating your chaos by running multiple chaos engineering experiments together in series or parallel let's say you your application wants to run pod delete pod cpu hog pod memory hog together so that can be curated in form of a workflow so that is where 2.0 focused in and it 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 has made the chaos engineering journey for a particular user so easy that you know it's it's uh, i i feel stoked to see the community response behind it so i mean these are a few advantages i mean over time the community collaboration and community meetings and feedback the feedback system has helped uh, develop litmus so it's open source of course so anyone can come in and contribute and the community feedback or community collaboration helps i mean open source is the present and the future interactive user interface i mean it it allows you to visualize everything analytics run your chaos experiments easily check out what's happening in the community as well alongside that you can curate your workflows according to specific scenarios there's a chaos hub as a marketplace another feature that litmus provides is an sdk 
so so you can bring in uh, your own chaos experiments you can write down your own chaos and run it with litmus so it also becomes easy for you to run if let's say you are running any other chaos engineering tool set then you can run their chaos experiments with litmus the functionalities of litmus or you can write your own experiment according to your own need let's say something is required for redis or you know a particular application then you can do that litmus provides you with custom health checks there's an http probe a prometheus probe a cmd probe where you can basically curate uh, health checks and check the health of the system and then you can schedule your chaos there's enhanced observability so i think the the demo will be helpful to help you understand that so perhaps with this we can answer a few questions and i'll i'll uh, allow Sayan to be sharing his screen and get started with the architecture. But before that, there has an outlook of the website. It's, it's a new revamped website. So as you can see, you can you can find everything that is required. You can get started on GitHub, get involved with the community. And we'll move on to contributions in the end. But uh, it's adopted by so many folks. And there are so many more folks. They might not have added their organizations. but yeah these these features are pretty helpful and i think the new revamped docs help you get started explore and and tutorials of, of course uh, help you the resources help you get started with chaos engineering easily uh, for your systems or to contribute to litmus so 2.0 just came out on the 15th of august so it's been four days so feel free to try it out and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to some questions now so so perhaps yeah, I'll I'll just stop sharing and we we can take a look at a few questions. Chaos engineering is like a technical recovery plan. Thanks, Sudhir. Of course, it is. Is chaos engineering being adopted for security use cases too? Of course, uh, they are being adopted for security use cases as well. I mean, uh, giving a few examples, e even. Uh, in a military, I mean, American Navy is using chaos engineering for their security purposes. Or if you talk about the fintech sector, then uh, chaos engineering is being practiced. I mean, for for the workloads to not go down. I mean, in India at 9:15, the the stock market opens up and then it continues to till 3:30. So there's a spike in users, and at that point of time, there are possibilities of security vulnerabilities too. Uh, people hacking into their systems and basically going into uh, the, their databases. So what is important is to identify uh, how the systems behave and what exactly goes down when there are sec security vulnerabilities that are possible. And that is where chaos engineering comes into fray. I hope uh, that answers the question. Is, is Are there any other questions? Perhaps I'm, I'm welcome to take them. and. Then, sorry, sorry and can we got somebody, we got somebody here. Uh, Char Charlie's asking if chaos engineering is being adopted for security use cases as well. Yeah, I, I just uh, answer that with uh, an example, and I think uh, I mean I, as I mentioned, yes, chaos engineering is being adopted for security use cases to identify uh, what is exactly going down when security vulnerabilities happen. I mean, let's say if if people are these databases are going down or there's uh, there's a huge possibility of data leaks, so that that is where uh, chaos engineering is also coming into fray to identify vulnerabilities or uh, the systems going down and basically being part of the uh, use case what are the most common types of chaos people are using i mean uh, there are so many scenarios uh, that people are using but if you if you talk about the most uh, common types of chaos that people are using i mean if you talk about fr from the aws point of view there's an ec2 terminate that people are using or let me just share my screen and 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 share the the chaos hub with you all just give me a sec so so as you can see i think the most common uh, chaos types that are being run is obviously the pod delete experiment the container kill experiment i mean in in the kubernetes uh, paradigm uh, ecosystem obviously these generic experiments are being used the most the pod delete pod cpu hog pod memory hog and they are uh, aligned according to their usage i mean pod network latency the network loss they just want to 
I mean, create a, a, a chaos experiment in, in your network and, you know, see your network going down slowly. So so all these experiments are being run the most. And on, on the AWS side of things, I think EBS lost by ID and uh, uh, even on the VMware side, VM power off, these are the most common experiments that have been used. These are the latest experiments that have come up, the AWS and VMware based experiments. But as, as Litmus has already been part of the Kubernetes ecosystem since the past two, two and a half years. So obviously uh, these experiments are, are the most used. The top five to seven are used the most to curate scenarios, especially the pod delete. I mean, that's that's used at a different level. Do we have any other questions? Hey, Prithvi, it's Scott here. Hey, um, I've got a bit of a question. You you touched on sort of culture early on. Um, what are you guys doing within sort of your business or what are you seeing when you're going to, to different clients as to how to tackle this cultural bias about avoiding doing chaos and chaos uh, experiments within their systems uh thanks a lot i think that's that's a great question i mean first of all a lot a lot of folks out there are actually reluctant i mean even in the business side of things i mean there are so many people who who still feel that chaos engineering is not their cup of tea or is not a priority for them if you talk about the e-commerce sector there are so many big giants out here in india itself and around the world who still believe that chaos engineering is not necessary for them but to tackle this challenge i think uh, the the example the real world scenarios or the real world events that have happened and the adopters the adoption stories have uh, really helped tackle these scenarios if i if i take an example of lens cart it's it's a global i mean it's 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 going global but it's an e-commerce giant in india and they they were reluctant to i mean uh, adopt chaos but today they have become advocates of chaos and they have been writing blogs and articles and curating videos on chaos engineering so i think uh, focusing on the cultural challenges uh, identifying your system and running a few game days are pretty important i think uh, curating a, a dedicated poc behind uh, i mean chaos various chaos engineering tool sets that are out there i mean i, I no tool is bad every tool has some sort of functionalities which which benefit one sort of a, an application or ecosystem and then running chaos test uh, in a controlled way initially just you know by the developers or the sre persona focusing on their slas and slos and then uh, bringing the practice of chaos engineering as, as a starter and then slowly shifting their workloads to chaos i think helps in the cultural shift but obviously it has to start with uh, checking out example stories and basically identifying that reliability is the major container challenge i mean the cncf has tagged reliability as one of the top container challenges uh, moving ahead so i think identifying these challenges and then catering or basically bringing in the practice of chaos helps uh, enterprises make it as a practice all right uh, do we have any other questions or or perhaps uh, we can I, i'll just transfer the control to cyan so cyan can move ahead and we can share some links as, as the talk goes on and we, we can have some amazing uh, features of litmus tool auto sure between that sounds good uh, my visible yes i am visible okay hi everyone uh, it's great to be here and uh, like uh, prithi mentioned at the start of this talk i am shyan i'm a software engineer at chaos native and i've been working with this litmus chaos project for over a year and it's been a great journey overall so let me just quickly uh, share my screen. I'd like to share my entire screen because I'll be moving my controls here and there. So um, I think that is good. All right. All right. So let me just uh, start off with talking about this entire architecture that we have. And before that, since you already know about uh, Chaos Engineering and uh, Prithvi has also introduced you to Litmus. So now I'll be showing you the different components that we are actually using in this project. And also I'll be talking about the latest features that uh, we provide as 
uh, reason like just to simplify the entire flow of chaos engineering and so you will be starting from a to z in the chaos workflow and you'll be using these tools to make your uh, life in that entire chaos workflow much much like you'll be having a lot less hassle if you do this so we'll be trying to show you in litmus way so to start off with uh, we have this architecture diagram where we have the SRE or the developer persona at the very start. Now, since uh, we are moving to a dev persona as well, previously we were focusing more on the SRE. So now it's like basically a developer as well as an SRE both can focus on the chaos engineering principles and they can both uh, try to do chaos workflows in whichever cluster they're on. It even works on the developer cluster in the dev cluster. Like let's say you have a uh, kind or mini cube in your system, then you can of course, um, do chaos engineering there as well, so it's pretty flexible. And uh, also, if you see this diagram, uh, the the certain persona is trying to run a pod network latency chaos experiment on their um, WordPress application. So they want to do some sort of a transaction in the database in MySQL database, and they want to uh, inject a pod network latency uh, chaos experiment. So this entire workflow would be uh, situated in this uh, litmus center, which is a chaos center, uh, which you get once you install the product. And that is like the central management hub where you can control everything of your chaos experiment. And also um, we have these three components, which is the authentication server, which helps you do the onboarding pretty quickly. And also the MongoDB where we use to, which we use as a database to store all the events that are happening in the workflow. And also GraphQL server, we use the different GraphQL APIs to uh, the different queries and subscription to get all the logs and uh, do the data management. And also a good thing about it is uh, we are also we have also integrated this entire setup with Grafana and Prometheus, so it will come hand in hand when you install this. You just need to install the utilities that are there, and that's all covered as a part of the documentation. So this would uh, like once you install monitoring in, in this particular setup, you would uh, seamlessly get an integration with Grafana and Prometheus. So all the events that are happening would be pretty observable and you would be able to get real time observability as your chaos is running. So I'll be also showing that to you in the demo today. Now, um, if you move forward in the architecture diagram, you'll see there's a chaos agent, which is uh, the Golang um, logo there. So the chaos agent is actually someone which would specifically be the target or the target cluster where you want the chaos injection to happen. So by default, when you install Litmus, it picks the chaos agent is picked up as the cluster where it is installed. So let's say I am installing this on Azure cluster, then my Azure cluster will be picked up as my target cluster, or that would be the cluster where I'm running my application I want to induce chaos on. So that is the idea behind it. But you can also change this chaos agent and switch it to different uh, clusters. So you can move it around. You can have multiple chaos agents. Uh, what I mean by that is you can you can be sitting on Azure and you can target your uh, workflows that are running on AWS or GCP or any other cloud provider. So that is completely doable. You just have to shift the uh, chaos agent to wherever, whichever cluster your application is running on. Uh, it can be namespaced. Of course, it can be a cluster-wide access to. So there's both scope availability as well. So um, moving forward, we have the Chaos Workflow CR, the Experiment CR, and the Engine CR. These are the resources that we use to construct the workflow, and this is all automated. So when you use the UI, you will just have to do certain clicks, and the workflow, the YAML of the workflow would be uh, created for you. Uh, like You can, of course, edit the YAML and do certain changes yourself if you are willing to do that. But uh, you can also import an entire YAML, but uh, this is sort of a flow of the UI that it would be automatically created for you, and you can just apply that YAML via the UI itself. And Chaos Operator is another CR that actually helps reconcile all these things that I just talked about, and it, um, like, keeps a check that the cluster you're targeting, is it available or not? And if the engine uh, is, like it validates the engine properties that you've provided to it. So like, let's say that duration is correct or not, whether the target cluster you're trying to uh, target is actually there. If the engine uh, properties, like, are you trying to force a chaos experiment on something which it's not, uh, like it's not having the right policies or not. So these kind of different checks is handled by the operator and uh, that is basically the heart of the entire chaos execution plane. Now moving forward, um, these are the two core components that I just talked about. The chaos center being the uh, single source of truth of the entire uh, workflow management that we do. And this consists a lot of features which we are also going to see in the next slides. But just to brief it about, uh, we would be seeing things like multi-tenancy and uh, 
GitOps and all these different features. Everything is controlled by the Chaos Center. That's why we call it as the single source of truth. And also Chaos Agent, like I just mentioned, uh, it can be, it is where you are putting which cluster you're choosing for your target or which cluster you're targeting where your application is sitting that you want to induce Chaos on. So now moving on to the different features that are provided by the Chaos Center, you can create uh, workflows, which would be like combining multiple Chaos experiments uh, to formulate one single workflow. So it can have, let's say, pod network loss, pod lead, uh, container kill, or any such uh, Chaos experiments that you want to execute uh, in, in a single workflow. And there's multiple ways of creating it. As you can see, there's uh, creation from template, from custom workflow. This is basically you creating, uh, you choosing which experiments you want to uh, induce, and then you're just creating a workflow with this option. And you can also do it uh, from pre-created YAML. So we provide uh, three pre-created uh, workflows for you, where it would just install the application as well as induce chaos on that application and gracefully delete all the uh, chaos resources that were created as a part of the process. So that is already handled. And fourth option is you can, of course, import uh, some YAML that you have in your local system. And you get control over experiment editing. So you can choose whether two or three or multiple chaos experiment steps can be uh, should be executed in parallel or would they be sequentially executed one after the other. You can run multiple of them together as well. So you have that level of control uh, as you go through the 2.0 UI. And you can also choose whether it's a single workflow or a cron workflow that you can choose as you uh, like construct the workflow from the UI. And then you can attach a certain priority or weights to each of the experiments. So let's assume you have three experiments or let's say two experiments. And let's say the pod lead experiment is not really that important in your scenario and you have a container kill experiment which is more important. So you can set a weight to each of them and you can just lower the weight of the pod lead. That way if, if let's say the pod lead experiment failed for whatever reason, your resilience score, the final resilience score of the entire workflow would not be affected that much because your weightage or the priority for that was low. Now moving on to workflow management, how we one of the features that help manage these different workflows is we have automated uh, the entire workflow with the help of GitOps, which we have another slide on, which I'll be talking on. And then also you can uh, add custom images using, uh, like let's say you're, you are willing to add your own custom uh, images that are sitting on your private Docker repository or something, you can do that. And you can also, you also have the option to measure and analyze the resilience scores that are generated as a part of this entire flow. Now for multi-tenancy, we have both scope support. Currently we have cluster scope as well as namespace scope support. So if you are willing to install this product on a namespace or on a shared cluster, you can definitely do so. Uh, with authentication, we have um, created a smooth onboarding process and all the user details are securely stored and they are absolutely secure. And uh, you also get role-based access control and you can create teams. So let's say you are running this uh, uh, chaos center on a certain cluster, your teammates might not have a cluster at all and you can create as, a, as an admin you can create multiple users and then you can share or invite them in your project and they would be able to access it from anywhere and uh, control your workflows and it it will also be uh, different based on how much access you give them so we have owner level access viewer or editor level access so based on that we have a role based access control as well now for monitoring and observability, we, you can connect your own data source if you have one, and you can visualize these runs. We have a, a we have an option to compare these workflows as well. So let's say you want to generate a report and share it between your teams. So you can select two or more workflows to compare. You can download a PDF and you can share them with your team, and you can upload your own dashboards as well. So you get a community uh, shared dashboard, or you you have your own Grafana dashboard that you want to upload. You can do the same, and uh, you can also tune these dashboards, of course, according to your preference. We have a whole wizard which will help you tune the same and you definitely can monitor this chaos in real time which i'll also be showing you uh, and also this slide is for GitOps especially so we have GitOps uh, integrated uh, with uh, the portal with this uh, chaos center when it first uh, when you install it or when it uh, is installed in your particular cluster so with that what happens is it's a bi-directional synchronous flow that gets connected when you activate this GitOps uh, uh, events, uh, which is also happening via this event tracker microservice that we have. So what happens is, let's say you touch a certain event from your Git, uh, Git-based source, and you change something there, it would be auto-triggered in your Chaos Center and vice versa. So you get a pretty synchronized uh, flow for this option. And also, last but not the least, non-Kubernetes chaos. With um, the advent of this new 2.0 support that we have, we are also targeting uh, bare metals and non-Kubernetes uh, entities. Like we, you can 
uh, be attacking some EC2 instances or um, like instances sitting on AWS, GCP, Azure, and also VMware. And uh, you just need to uh, add a secret to your particular cluster and they'll be able to access the these entities sitting there. And you don't even need a chaos agent in these uh, entities. Like you don't need to have a chaos agent sitting in AWS or GCP to attack a certain EC2 instance running on your AWS. So that's a new thing that we have added with the 2.0. And in a, in a gist, what it, what is new is with Turado, we have new chaos workflows, theming. Uh, it's also cross cloud, like I mentioned, and we have uh, public as well as both private chaos hubs. So Prithi already showed you what the hub looks like, but if you can have your own private hub, which I have connected as well as a part of this demo. Uh, previously it was CLI only, now you have GUI as well. Now we also support GitOps. Uh, it's more scalable and it has integrated and interleaved monitoring. Now let's just jump right into the demo. I would try to make it as fast as I can but also not uh, overwhelm you with a lot of information. So what I have here is uh, uh, my cluster is uh, an Azure cluster. And let me just give you a brief setup tour of what I have. So this is uh, not this, this is the uh, components that are required. Ignore the completed ones, uh, but rather than those, the others are the components that are required for um, this uh, 2.0 litmus product to run. These are all dependent uh, components, and you saw this uh, entirely in the architecture diagram as well. So this is uh, the Mongo, this is the GraphQL and the auth authentication server. This is the front end, and then we have event tracker for GitOps, Chaos operator and exporter, uh, and then we also have the workflow controller. And the subscriber, which actually brings out the logs as well. So we have all these uh, dependent services that we require in order for the uh, Chaos Center to work. And uh, what we are going to do today in this demo is we have this application called SockShop. Now, what is SockShop? SockShop is a sock selling application, which is only there for demos or microservice, microservice demos. So we are going to utilize that particular uh, application, that particular microservice application that is out there in open source. Uh, and uh, this is how it looks like. So we have a front end. You have um, these different microservices, order, payment, user, catalog, card, and it also uses RabbitMQ. Uh, so we are going to target this particular catalog pod and we are going to delete that catalog pod with the help of this tool that I just mentioned. And I'm going to show you how you can do that. And while we do that, we also have Grafana connected. So we have a Grafana dashboard as well. So when you install, let's say you integrate Grafana and Prometheus, when you uh, set up the uh, this chaos center, you would already have a lot of dashboards there provided. So you would have a node and CPU metrics dashboard. You would have a, uh, this uh, sock shop dashboard and uh, a lot of other dashboards. I guess there are four total which are already there for you. And then you can manually create them. Or like I said, you can download uh, one from the community or if you have yours, you can upload that. So this is what we are going to uh, do today. Let me just change it to last, last five minutes and that's fine. So this is how the sock shop application looks like. So this is uh, when it's deployed. Now this area, which is the, the carousel, I'm gonna like delete the pod that is handling this carousel. So while Kiosk is injected, you will see that this space completely goes empty and the other services will be running just fine, but this particular area would just uh, blank out. And that's how you know that that would be, that is under tension and the pod is evicted. Um, and also we'll, we'll be seeing this uh, because I have a watch statement right here on this auction namespace. So this particular catalog pod would be evicted. So you would be seeing that from three hours, it's certain seconds or it's terminating. So let me just go through the entire flow. And by the way, I also have a private hub connected. Uh, so like Prithvi showed you the uh, global hub. Uh, this is something that I have uh, on my private GitHub repository. So I call it demo charts. And there I have this core DNS and some generic experiments. So I wanted to connect this in my um, this chaos center. So I just had to click on this and just provide the Git URL and then SSH key. And that's it. And any if you have some private uh, workflows that you want to run, you can do this via the Chaos Hub option. Now let me go ahead and uh, schedule a workflow. So what I will do is I'll choose the particular agent that I want to run this on. Now in this case, like I mentioned, where you install this product is automatically picked up as a self agent or the agent you want to be the target cluster. So in this case, self agent, which is my Azure, uh, uh, this cluster is already picked up as the target cluster that I want to inject Chaos on. And I also have this talk show application running on the Azure cluster itself. So it would be uh, I would select that particular agent itself. Now, uh, from here on, I can I gave you all the different options that you can choose from from template, chaos hub, and 
uh, YAML. So if you were to run any private experiments, you can do this from here, uh, from your private hub. But I'll just go with the uh, de facto uh, Sock Shop application, which is the predefined application, which uh, also tries to install your application uh, if you don't have it running yet. So I'll just select this. Uh, this is fine. I'll just call it Sock Shop Demo, maybe. Let's go next. And uh, here I'm going to make some changes because I don't want this to go too long. I will be shortening this entire huge thing up quite a bit. So I'm going to uh, delete all these experiments that are not needed. Uh, port CPU hog, port memory uh, hog also delete, port network loss and catalog disk fill. So I'll just have this catalog port delete uh, there. And also you can see a lot of other things. Like if I zoom in, you would see install application is there, which I don't need because I already have this running. Uh, this one, I already have this running. So I would also delete load test and delete load test. So I'll just go to the YAML real quick and try to delete this install application step, load test step and uh, delete the load test. Yeah. And also there's one more change I'm gonna make. I'm going to change this from resilient to weak. Now what to do is uh, if I had it and have it in resilient mode, it'll try to add replica sets. So basically it'll try to create three different pods. So if one is evicted, it'll automatically be resilient because it's a replica set. So I'll just change it to weak, which will just create individual uh, one replica set. So it'll just be one pods for each deployment. Now I'll just go ahead and uh, click on next. This is the weightage area, which I talked about. If you have multiple experiments, you can control the weight uh, selection. I'll go ahead and do a schedule now. And this is the summary of what exactly I've selected. Uh, for me, it looks fine, I believe. Now I just go ahead and do finish. Now, once that is done, uh, what will happen is it will try to install the chaos experiment, which is the pod delete. In this case, I would go to my sock shop dashboard and uh, the Grafana dashboard. And I'll just check if the, this hasn't been up yet. But uh, once that happens, once the chaos is injected, once the application, the catalog pod lead application is installed, it will try to trigger that via a chaos job. And when that happens, we would be seeing that this catalog pod is uh, being evicted. evicted. And yeah, that's done, I believe. So this is in pending state right now. And also a good thing is if you click on this particular node, you would be getting live logs of what is exactly happening. This is like basically kubectl logs. So you'll get all the logs here and the chaos result is another CR which actually gives you the verdict of what happened uh, once the experiment, uh, what was the verdict of the experiment once it finished. So this is still going on, okay. And if I go to the litmus game space, I can see my Shop demo application is, uh, this is running. I would have a catalog pod delete or some kind of a pod delete pop up. Yeah, there you go. So a pod, pod delete was popped up 32 seconds ago. It's starting to inject and you can see, oh, this just happened, sorry. <laughs> so you can see it's 21 seconds and this just killed the pod. Now, if I go ahead and refresh this, it should be empty, I believe. Yeah, so you can see, okay, it's taking a bit, it's a little slow. So um, the middle catalog, this entire carousel is gone. The other service is running just fine. If I go to my Grafana dashboard, and I select this new uh, pod delete that was just, just that just happened. And this is my engine context. So I'll just keep them same. You can see the orange, this marked area is what uh, highlighting what exactly happened. And if I just hover over it, which is my catalog QPS, you can see the other services are working fine, but the catalog QPS will go down and the current verdict is awaited and it will show you all the different uh, metadata of what exactly is happening. You can see it's verdict is awaited. Once the in, uh, injection has been finished and everything is completed, it will obviously um, clean all the resources because we had a, a revert chaos uh, step as well in the process. So uh, it will this will turn purple and the purple will be the uh, actual verdict. It will say that it passed or failed. In this case, it will fail because we had two probes actually sitting in here, which is a CMD probe and an HTTP probe. So those probes will not be able to uh, run perfectly. So that's why the entire uh, experiment will fail. But the pod was evicted, as you can see clearly. So in this case, yeah, this is trying to get back up. But while this happens, you can see that this would be complete, like the execution will be completed. And then you'll be seeing a verdict right here, which specifies that what exactly was the final verdict of the entire workflow that happened. And that's that's it. That's how you would perform this uh, entire uh, workflow. 
So this is pretty easy. Now, if you wanted to have this entire Grafana dashboard integrated in your uh, Chaos Center, you can also use this analytics tab where you can add this data source and everything. But that's about it for uh, the demo. Now, to add more on the roadmap and the future plans that we have. So what exactly are the future plans? So I guess, yeah. So we wanted to increase the support of non-Kubernetes uh, chaos that we have, and we want to make this more application specific. Like we currently have Kafka, Cassandra, and those kind of application specific chaos, but we want to increase the application support. We want to improve the chaos SDK as well for creation of user-defined experiments. We want to make it more flexible. And also, uh, currently we have four probes, HTTP, CMD, KTS, and PromQL probe. Prom probe. So we want to add additional probes as well so that you can do multiple uh, steady state hypothesis validation. And of course, observability is something which is very important. So we want to improve that for user experiences and we want to add more and more chaos types. So currently we have 50 plus, but we want to add more and more. So that's it for the future uh, roadmap. For contributing, we actually welcome all kinds of contribution, whether it's documentation change or a huge feature change. And these are the five uh, repositories that we have personally highlighted, but there's a lot more. So we have the chaos charts, uh, chaos workflows, testing tools, where we have load tests and all these kind of uh, things going on. Like we have curated our own manifest and stuff for applications like this, Sock Shop and Bank of Anthos and those things. Litmus Go is the SDK that we that Prithvi mentioned at the beginning. And website Litmus Chaos is the Litmus Chaos IO website. So if anyone wants to contribute in front end, they can use this. And these are some references of the code, the documentation, the old documentation and our Slack channel. And thank you. That's about it for the talk from my side. The demo goes for smiling on you there. I know we've got one uh, in here from Amir, I think it is. He's asking about an example of um, GitOps uh, with uh, Chaos. Okay, so I can show this. It would be basically, if you go to settings, there's an option to enable GitOps if you just come over here. So currently it's locally in Litmus, which means it's using Mongo. If you click on GitOps repository, it'll ask you the Git URL. So I, I believe I have a demo uh, GitOps somewhere. I don't know if it still come up, demo GitOps. It's somewhere around in GitHub, in my GitHub uh, repository. So if you go over there, you just have to just uh, attach the URL and the branch, and then you can either use this SSH key and attach it to that repository as a, uh, you know, uh, you have obviously have to give your SSH uh, URL as well. And once you do that, it will create a random uh, hash of the for, of a folder. It'll just create a random folder of the event that is happening. So let's say you create a workflow ABC. It will just do ABC hyphen some random hash, and all the events happening in that particular workflow would be stored in uh, in that repository. So currently, it will take some time for me to do the workflow. That's why I'm just showing you how it's done. You can just copy over this code, deploy the key in your GitHub repository, and that should be fine. Cool. Yeah. Um, Scott, Scott, Dylan, or Tom, any other questions for you guys? Uh, yeah, just one from me. Hey, Sam. Uh, Scott here. Hey, um, if you could sort of run litmus against sort of any system or any business what business would that be that you'd get the most excitement out running running this against and as experiments try and try and you know think big what 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 would you sort of intentionally try and break that would be just catastrophic and, and awesome at the same time one interesting use case that we just had is in the banking sector actually so because banking is something which is needs to be extremely secure so there's also comes the use case of security and also the use case of resilience which is it works both ways so it's like a plus plus one there so if you break anything in the banking sector that would be huge so that's why there's something called as a black hole testing if you've heard of it which basically is a hundred percent packet loss so if you take away all the packets or all the network transactions that are happening in, a, in banking like deposits, uh, withdrawal and everything, then banking is completely broken. So that is one scenario which is absolutely wonderful. And we also have a use case for that, which is the Bank of Anthos, which is one of the predefined um, microservice applications that we have. 
Now it does a black hole uh, testing there as well, black hole chaos test, which actually isolates the one of the pod completely and sees what happens when that happens in your particular application. Would the transaction go through? Would the other uh, microservice break and those things? So I would definitely say banking is one sector which is really interesting. Thanks, man. Sounds awesome. Black hole test. That sounds epic. Cheers. I've got a, a quick question as well. It's Stephen. Um, essentially, when you install uh, tooling such as this, you know, inside, you know, your Kubernetes cluster, it's basically it's the finger of God, as in you, you know, you're giving all all the privileges under the sun. Uh, how um, how do you overcome security fears? You know, when you're trying to encourage financial institutions and stuff like that to use your product, how how do you get over that barrier? Yeah, that's a really that's a real challenge actually. When we come over to university or some other, uh, you know, large scale uh, setup where we have to convince them to use it, and because they, obviously that's a shared environment, and uh, nothing is, you know, it's a, everything is pretty secure, and we don't want to. We also want to gain their trust, and we also want to make things secure. So that's one thing where we suggest that it's always a good idea. To if you if you're not 100 sure about what uh, if there's any security flaws or if something might break in, in production, so that's why we have this idea of layering them down into two or three levels like uh, production, then it's pre-production, it's staging, it's pre-staging uh, as and down you can go, it's uh, limitless. So what I do manually or personally is I run things when I, when I'm developing, I run them dev in in a dev cluster, right? So we suggest that have some sort of a setup which would not harm the actual production setup like you can have a pre-staging or a staging setup and you can just copy over the deployment or whatever you're trying to break and then you can just practice this entire uh, chaos uh, scenario that you have in your mind so that would completely be safe and secure because our product itself is isolated from all the other uh, environments so this is actually air gapped as well so it's pretty isolated so it would be definitely secure if you want to try that in that uh, pre-staging or staging cluster. So that is one way, or you can like use uh, dev clusters like Kind or K3S or Minikube, and then you can try that as well because it's as simple as Minikube delete to delete everything that you have. There. I suppose there's there's a related question to that, and that is what what do you typically see as the biggest obstacle? to people you know take it taking the product on and and how, how would you recommend that people mitigate that risk okay so one risk uh, i would say is the scenarios like we cannot uh, like there's no way that we can 100 percent know what your scenario is so we have some predefined experiments we have a way of uh, creating the custom experiments but there's always these scenarios where a certain person is trying to do certain ABC task and they do not get exactly what they're looking for because they have to create it for themselves, right? So that's one challenge because uh, as, as chaos engineers, we try to come up with different solutions that we can do to integrate them in, in, the, in the manifest that we create for these injections. So that is one thing. Now, uh, one way to mitigate these changes are, I would say like currently we use Argo as a wrapper. So we try to curate Argo workflows on top of everything that is the scenario. And that helps actually connect the nodes, connect the different Argo childs or the children that are spawned as a part of these uh, workflows. So that helps us uh, curate any kind of experiment. We are also have, obviously have to do some research around it as to what, um, might be the dependencies of the scenarios that you're trying to look forward to. So yeah, as as a as a user for a certain scenario, which is very you know uh, top of the line, we have to uh, do a lot of brainstorming about what could be the solution. So that has definitely been one of the challenges. But we have around 50 plus experiments only for the risk to mitigate this risk that people don't go there and try to find something that they did not find. So that has been definitely one of the risks. I suppose it would be a really good idea, I think, to make sure that you've got a regular operational monitoring system uh, on your clusters at the same time or like before. So at least you know what normal looks like from a cluster perspective, you know, to make sure that even though stuff is breaking, you've still got continuity of service according to your operational dashboard. Mm -hmm. 
Would that be a useful thing, do you reckon? Yeah, you can, like you mean connecting a additional dashboard to what we already have? Yeah, I think just having, you know, having an, uh, an operational monitoring system that's already looking at, mm -hmm. you know, at your cluster before you start to implement, you know, any chaos. So at least from a cluster perspective, you may have a degraded cluster, but you'll still have a dashboard that says that you've got continuity of service for your customers. Yeah, definitely. That would be definitely a, a big change, a big help. Uh, and also the exact requirement that you just mentioned to do these uh, operational checks, we actually came up with these four probes that I just mentioned in the talk as well, like the HTTP and these other kind of probes, which have four modes actually, which is SOT, EOT, continuous, and edge. Uh, so if you do edge, it basically checks, it, it's a pre-check that happens both before and after the chaos injection. So that way you can do anything that you want. Let's say you want to check some kind of operational uh, um you want to do some kind of prometheus queries or something then you can use the prom prom probe and you can put it in edge mode that way if you want to have any sort of uh, querying before the injection happens you can do that so that's the, that was the main intention of putting probes into the picture when we try to do this kind of chaos experiments but that way it will it helps currently like, like that but if you want to have a separate dashboard completely monitoring this setup then yeah definitely that uh would be recommended as well Oh, thank you for that. Uh, guys, any, um, any other questions before maybe Scott, Scott or Dylan will wrap up? No questions for me. Scott, did you want to wrap up? I did yeah. one question. Uh, is there a way people can try out with more without having a Yes, obviously we can't But uh, there's a uh this uh, new scenario in catacoda that we have uh, came up with so basically it's catacoda.com slash litmus for i guess pretty you can share the link as well uh since catacoda is already a provider it's running on top of kubernetes as well in that particular scenario so you can just follow that and you can use uh catacoda as your provider as your cluster in this case and you can explain it was so you, you can definitely do that thanks for that sam uh, great talk man that was awesome Always love to hear about the chaos stuff. Um, also, thanks to uh, Brivy and uh, Anthony, our, our talkers for tonight. All awesome talks, um, very good subjects, and it's nice to have uh, uh, another sort of meetup operational, and hopefully we'll be bringing another one to, uh, to you guys shortly.